Oh, good morning. Uh, can you um, hear me okay, Milena? Can yes. everyone hear me? Yep, good, excellent, excellent, good. So let's um, make a start. We've got quite a large number of slides representing a long document. So it will be a little bit of a gallop, um, but we'll, we'll see if we can cover everything. Um, and we will try and dip into uh, a couple of issues in a little bit more detail. Uh, so, of course, um, we will be 45 minutes will flash by and you will have to go and download the report itself if you want to get into more detail. Um, and as Melinda says, we'll do our best to answer questions. But of course, um, if there's anything that's a little bit tricky, we can take it away and, and put it to one of the many people that have been involved in this project. So just to us begin with, uh, we'll uh, we'll just think about you know what what the purpose of this is for. Uh, although it's uh, aimed primarily at local authority planners and, and other professionals involved in greening uh, greening our towns and cities and, and countryside, um, it, it could be used by anyone who's interested in bringing more soil, water and vegetation into their neighbourhood. And we hope it will inspire uh, people to create healthier, more nature rich and climate resilient places, uh, not only where they live, but where they're where they're where they're working. Um, and, and of course, uh, for the youngsters where they're playing as well. So it's it, it will have a wider use than local authority, but we hope that local authorities will will be able to integrate this with um, their approaches to design guidance and design codes. And of course, there is the national design guidance, national model design code. So this is designed to complement that by uh, perhaps uh, adding a bit more detail on the green infrastructure part of that. So um, it's worth bearing in mind that there's a there's a whole uh, setting for this. Uh, so the green infrastructure framework looks at a whole range of uh, other issues, biodiversity net gain, urban greening factor, local nature recovery strategies. So so it's it's part of a whole suite of initiatives and you'll see those on the website. Uh, it's important to say that this design guide is landscape led. Um, there's a focus on landscape character and local distinctiveness and experts in a wide range of fields, including um, including geology, ecology uh, and heritage have fed into the development of this project. So um, it's worth just thinking about the application of the framework itself and the principles of green infrastructure, which we'll look at again in a moment. And of course, there are standards out there, accessible green space standards um, and and tools like the urban greening factor as well. So so there's a whole range of, of standards and tools and targets, for instance, urban tree canopy cover, which are there as background to this. Um, as I said earlier, it is it is designed to work with uh, design codes and the national model design code, and we'll come on to the, uh, the the design the national design guides ten characteristics of well designed places and and how this interacts with that intersects with that. So this is a, a useful way of uh, perhaps seeing how this fits together. So I've highlighted the design guide, but as I say, we've got the principles, we've got the standards, and it's also worth noting at this point that there's a huge uh, amount of information available underpinning this. So you've got um, the the mapping database for it, for England, um, and there's reviews that are there, and of course the, a whole host of other documents, authoritative documents, uh, peer review papers, which are which are referred to and linked in the document as well. So so there's a lot to this and and it's certainly worth clicking on these uh, these links when you see them in the text, because that will give you the background for, for what might be a, a summary of, of, of what we're saying. So the principles are worth just pausing on for a moment. We've got the the how, what and why principles, 15 of them. Um, so it's a, a virtuous circle, if you like. 
so we need to to think about why we're doing this. So you know we're we're restoring nature. Uh, of course, we want places to be beautiful. Uh, we want people to be active and healthy. Um, we we want places to thrive. Um, we're very very aware nowadays of blood risk, water management, um, uh, heat waves, and so on. So we want places to be uh, more resilient. And then, of course, we need to get into uh, what we're aiming for. Multifunctionality is really a big deal now, and it's something perhaps in the past has been overlooked. So we'll we'll come on to that again in a, in a couple of minutes. We want variety. We want connectivity, um, not only for people but for wildlife. The accessibility is important. People need to be able to get to these places, or they need to be on their doorstep as well. Uh, and of course, it, as as I've already said, it's about landscape. It's about local character. And then, of course, uh, how we go about this is very much about having strategies, uh, good mapping, um, working with people to create a vision and, and referring to the evidence. Um, and of course, it's really important that we think before we create about how places are going to be looked after in the long term, how they're going to be nurtured, um, how they're going to be monitored and, and also how we're going to evaluate what we've done to to learn lessons from it. So the standards um, are, are not really the the main focus this morning, but uh, we'll just uh, just make a note of that, that of course uh, we've got that there to refer to. Um, most of these you'll be familiar with. Accessible green space standards have been around for a while, but they've been updated. And of course, uh, the local nature recovery networks are now being, uh, if you like, relaunched. So there's, there's information on that. And the urban greening factor, which is already operational in London and, and, and the centre of Southampton and in Wales and Swansea, it's, it's operating, is likely to be rolled out across England and there are other cities currently looking at that. So that sets um, uh, that that's a way of measuring uh, the amount of green infrastructure in a planning application and setting uh, setting some targets for, for applicants to aim for. So point four, about 40 percent of of a site being green. And of course, urban tree canopy standards uh, have, be, have been refreshed as well. So uh, as I say, you'll be familiar with this. You're, it's been updated. Um, uh, there are experts in Natural England who can provide you with, with a bit more insight into that if you need it. But I suppose in essence, uh, we're, we're wanting people to have green space on their doorstep and then larger uh, regional spaces within a, a reasonable distance. So as I say, this plugs into the uh, uh, the National uh, Model Design Codes. There are 10 um, characteristics. Um, within the document, there are a series of um, uh, a series of matrices, and I've just got one here just as an example, but there are several pages of this which relate um, relate the, the two documents together, if you like, the framework to the National Model Design Code so that people can understand how they intercept. So, um, pages of this which which you can look at um, and uh, hopefully that will improve the integration of, of these different approaches. So um, it's worth you know looking at the how principles of green infrastructure uh, which we've already looked at and seeing how that relates to the steps. So this is about process. Um, and you can see that it's a, a similar a similar approach that uh, in the national model design code you're 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 moving towards your code you you've got your analysis you have your vision then you have your code and green infrastructure works in parallel with that um, similar similar processes. Now um, one of the chapters in the guidance is, are the is the building blocks of green infrastructure. So this is a way of breaking down the elements so that people can think about these uh, in as elements. Of course, uh, the larger they get, the more general the category, uh, but we thought it was quite useful to review where we are with these. Um, and of course, some people will be very familiar with some of these and others are, are relatively new. And there's, there's, there's guidance, of course, detailed guidance for some of this 
as well, which uh, is referred to in the text. So, for instance, sustainable drainage is is has been um, identified as a building block, even though you could argue it's more of a more of a philosophy than a building block. But people often think of this as as a separate element. Uh, and of course, there, there's plenty of guidance there from uh, the Construction Industry Research Association on that. Uh, but it's worth you know, remembering that, that, that there is, a, uh, there is a, um, a way of thinking about SUDS which has an impact on the wider environment. And you, you have this control, um, uh, this chain of control from source. Um, site control to regional control, and then hopefully avoiding the use of pipe. So, so as you as you move water from from where it lands to where it ends up in watercourses and so on, um, soaking up that water, creating what we call the sponge city. So, so there's a lot to uh, look into there in more detail. Uh, plenty of guidance on that. Of course, one of the sources, the source control features of of suds are green roofs and of course we're now hearing about blue roofs um, there's a thriving industry now in this but we need to be careful to look at multifunctionality and biodiversity it's not just a matter of uh, a very simple approach there's actually a lot that can be done on buildings and, and with roofs and of course there are roof gardens as well and there's there's uh, guidance out there the grow code is available it's recently been reissued uh, providing you on minimum uh, standards uh, for green roofs. So it's important that good quality green roofs go into our, uh, our built environment. And of course, we can vegetate vertical surfaces in traditional ways and also in, in some of the more modern modular ways. So again, there's some thoughts on, on that. It's, uh, it's not one size fits all. There's, there's quite a lot to think about with that. Um, and of course, Back to the theme of sustainable drainage. Uh, now that it's it's now moving into the mainstream, and the government's given the green light for this finally in England. So we're really going to have to do more of this, and we want to have plenty of uh, nature-based solutions in that as well, and and not over o an over reliance on things like uh, uh, tanks and uh, and basins, which is you know unfortunately we get a little bit too much of that. And important to remember multifunctionality as well, of course. We'll come back to that. And of course, uh, biodiversity and features for species. So uh, there's a lot that can be done along these lines for birds, bats, invertebrates. And again, plenty of good guidance out there. And it's important that these things are, are installed in places where they actually work. And you'll find that the suppliers and the NGOs that, that advise on this provide uh, plenty of detail on on where these things go. So it's not just a matter of buying and fitting. It's a matter of knowing uh, the best places to put these things. Now, of course, trees in hard landscapes can be very challenging, but it's important that we make enough space for, for trees and we sometimes we, we uh, combine these with uh, sustainable drainage as well. So so uh, the, the tree and design, the tree design and uh, the, the TDAG um, who advise on trees in hard landscapes. There's plenty of uh, guidance to download with that one as well. So, so again, you know, it's not always enough just to do the minimum here. We probably have to work harder in the future to to um, make more space for trees in hard landscapes. And lots of novelty features, if you are novel features, novelty is the wrong term because they are worthwhile, but novel features. Uh, utility structures, street furniture that can incorporate um, features for wildlife. So there's a lot of really interesting initiatives along those lines. And of course, um, there are uh, there's a big push now to have traffic free routes for um, pedestrians and cyclists and so on. And we need to make sure that our green infrastructure is incorporated with that. So there's uh, plenty to look at and links there within the document on that one. Um, orchards is in there, very, very popular. Now we're hearing about this all the time. Uh, and there's again, there's guidance on how to set about that. And plenty of people have already successfully created community orchards in particular in urban areas. Uh, and more conventional, traditional things like allotments and food growing. So uh, we're working through our list of building blocks. Um, and then, of course, uh, parks, 
gardens, uh, conventional, traditional, if you like, but we need to perhaps work a little bit harder in the future to make these multifunctional. And uh, of course, we people can do what they wish within reason in their private gardens, but we like to encourage people to make the most of private uh, gardens as well in order to uh, add to the overall green infrastructure network. And then, of course, this huge category of natural green space. Um, of course, the focus for green infrastructure is tends to be more on urban and suburban areas, but uh, natural green spaces are in urban areas and they form the core uh, the, the core features within uh, wider networks. So it's very important that these are looked after properly um, and, and that people have the opportunity to access them as well. Uh, and of course, there's um, you know, there's there's a lot there already protected uh, in terms of heritage features and the his historic environment, but also that can be um, an inspiration for creating green infrastructure, which is uh, sympathetic to compatible with um, uh, with uh, heritage, restoration, conservation of heritage. So um, plenty that plenty of really good examples and we'll come back to this, but there's also um, a suite of case studies on the green on the Natural England website, which people can refer to, but we'll come back to that at the, at the end. And another category getting to towards the end of the building blocks now but another category is what we're calling blue space and of course that would be water bodies and waterways and rivers and, and so on canals but uh, we're often able to provide green space blue space sorry within uh, urban areas and this this is this particular example in Stratford in uh, in London is it, is quite interesting because it's there in a new urban area in a place where you probably traditionally wouldn't expect to see uh, such a natural blue space. And of course, this also functions as part of the sustainable drainage network. So, uh, so there are plenty of uh, good examples out there to inspire us. And of course, uh, play can be rather uh, urban and harsh, but it doesn't have to be. Um, Play areas can include planting and natural features, um, and there's there's a lot of people working on this now to to try and get more out of, of play space um, to make it more natural. Uh, and there's evidence that this you know this benefits uh, everyone involved. So uh, those are the building blocks. Um, now there's a section in the document on multifunctionality, how green infrastructure de uh, delivers multiple benefits and so there's a, a review in here which is quite useful with links to the evidence for those benefits uh, so um, uh, uh, we don't have time today to to go through that um, and we've reached a very good position now because years ago a lot of this was more of an in, in, inkling that there were benefits now because of all the great work that's gone on um, since the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, um, there's um, there's a lot of evidence to show how a green infrastructure really brings about improvements in, you know, for instance, air quality, um, how it can improve microclimates and so on. Um, so there's some discussions of this, a look at uh, the networks as well. Um, uh, there's some consideration of soil and, and geodiversity. Of course, we need to be aware of that, um, and also the local, uh, you know, the local situation that each site is in. Um, and of course, we've already touched on water, but of course, we've got water security in the future to think about, as well as drainage, and how there's this great potential to do more for green and blue infrastructure um, as we spend money on grey infrastructure or what would otherwise be grey infrastructure. So so we really need to think about multifunctionality and integration in that and not not have an over reliance on grey infrastructure. So there's really important uh, discussions to be had uh, uh, around that uh, theme of water. And microclimate is something that perhaps isn't widely known that of course green infrastructure provides shading, 
evaporative cooling and it will save lives in heat waves in the future no doubt because um, you know we've seen how that works where places that don't have green infrastructure become uh, very overheated in heat waves and those with shade trees and green roofs and so on uh, fare uh, fare better than uh, than those that don't so uh, again links to the evidence for that uh, and there's a great interest in food growing now uh, volunteers but also commercial food growing in in urban areas especially people can get food close to where they live and with the price of food I think you'll see more and more of this and of course you can make food grow growing areas uh, very important social spaces you can have features for wildlife um, and you still need to think about multifunctionality there might even be a sustainable drainage element to some of these installations as well and of course we want to make sure that uh, that um, people can access these uh, this green infrastructure and again there's a lot of evidence now that uh, green infrastructure uh, by providing places where people can exercise is good for their their health but but even looking at greenery re reduces blood pressure and of course it improves mental health as well and again there's there's lots of evidence to support that uh, uh, that benefit and uh, linear features you know footpaths cycleways and so on uh, will make people healthier uh, but of course it will also reduce our carbon footprint so really important that we, we accelerate uh, adoption creation of these active travel routes um, and we we make sure that those are also green infrastructure corridors linking together um, parks and green space and, and so on and uh, there's a lot of evidence now that uh, we can uh, screen schools, for instance, with green infrastructure from uh, from the fumes from traffic. Uh, green walls have been shown to uh, reduce uh, air pollution in urban canyons. Uh, so again, a lot, a lot of work's been done on that um, and the evidence is there and it's yet another benefit uh, which helps us to justify the creation of more green infrastructure. Perhaps not so well known. Uh, soil in particular is very good at the dampening sound, um, but uh, even the leaves on a, on a green wall can uh, reduce uh, sound. Um, so again, uh, plenty of evidence for this um, and it, it can change the whole uh, feel of an area by having uh, more trees to dampen sound um, as well as providing all those other benefits. And of course there are well-known and long-used uh, uh, interventions like vegetated buns and so on as well as some of the more um, more recently adopted uh, features in town so there's a lot more we can do to uh, improve um, soundscapes and reduce noise in towns and of course uh, the, there's uh, places for people to learn uh, to volunteer uh, to meet people and get involved um, initiatives like forest school uh, conservation volunteers and so on and it's really important that uh, people think about place making sense of place and often there are um, heritage features including industrial heritage which can uh, which can be the features that can be retained or there's a feel about a place that needs to be acknowledged and um, Mayfield Park in Manchester is a good example of that. It's one of the case studies that I mentioned earlier. So um, we're going to um, look now at the next chapter. Um, so we're uh, racing through this, uh, but there's so much to cover. Um, so uh, what what the team has done is to divide um, divide the the urban and rural landscape into these area types. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's not always easy to, uh, you know, to categorize an area, especially in the urban fringe where there may be different types, if you like, uh, close together. But for the purposes of this exercise, they've been 
divided into you know the urban core if you like deep urban high streets there's a special interest in that now so that's been separated out urban streets um, and then moving out into suburbia and, and uh, the countryside uh, but of course we have particular uh, land uses where there's a, a lot of interest in green infrastructure um, and we'll we'll take a look at those as well and of course come back to our linear infrastructure again so important in the networks of, of green infrastructure now for each of these um, area types there's there's an analysis of of how uh, the green infrastructure guidance for that a code for that might relate back to the standards so that's quite helpful uh, for anyone who perhaps would be uh, devising a uh, devising a design code for a particular area they can look at this and think about how uh, the green infrastructure that they're proposing or promoting might relate to um, uh, the standards so that that's in there for each of these which is quite useful and a good reminder because you know as we get into the nitty-gritty we often forget the the principles and the standards so it's it's nice to check back against that so uh, for each of the um, uh, for each of these area types, there's a, a graphic produced by um, uh, Jacobs, which relates to the text. And uh, of course, the text has a discussion of what the issues and opportunities are. Um, and you know, of course, this is uh, conceptual. This isn't an actual place, though. Of course, it it's based on knowledge of particular places, so it is generic. Uh, but it's just a few suggestions of what can be done to really bring more soil, water and vegetation into an urban area in this case. Um, and just a reminder uh, that there's perhaps synergies there as well. Um, so and of course, again, the case studies will will eventually show people what has already been achieved. And of course, great um, challenge in the urban area because there is a predominance of sealed surfaces. Um, but there are ways of, of bringing more soil and water into the urban area so i suppose the um the obvious one uh, is green roofs uh, which is now starting to become very popular especially in places like london where it's a it's often a requirement of the planning authority for any new building and as i said at the beginning when we were looking at that typology it's really important that the, that we have sufficient depth of substrate in those in order to provide those benefits that we're after and of course often in towns there's too much paving or more paving than there needs to be so a de-pave agenda is is something else to look at and certainly in terms of um um you know the look that people are are having the close look at the um uh, the pre predominance of roads and sealed services in towns you know as we're reviewing um transport planning people are increasingly aware of the fact there's probably more uh, emphasis on 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 motor vehicles and there there needs to be in many places so we're able to provide cycleways and green infrastructure and perhaps uh, reduce the amount of of paving um, vegetating buildings and then you know we're we're then getting all those microclimate benefits suds benefits biodiversity benefits health and well-being benefits that we're after so uh, plenty of good ideas in there of course what's achievable in a particular area will vary somewhat um, and there will be constraints uh, which are peculiar to certain places, but uh, hopefully people will get plenty of ideas from this. I mean, one one of the um, urban initiatives that I'm personally very keen on is the idea of uh, daylighting culverted streams or, or watercourses that are underground, bringing them back to the surface, making them more na as natural as they can be. And of course, that can have a, um, a, a regeneration, regenerating effect as well. So, so some of these things can be really important for the um, for the way that that, that places become um, thriving, and and the uh, the businesses can be reactivated because of uh, these innovative interventions. And then, of course, as we move out into the suburbs, things are a little bit different. There tends to be more green infrastructure around but the issue there might be 
uh, bringing it, making it accessible, improving the biodiversity, um, and and connecting um, green space together, uh, which can be a challenge, of course, because of all the roads that we have in our towns and cities. And linear features become more important, um, new hedges, that kind of thing. Um, but also uh, regional features, which could be important in terms of improving water quality uh, in water courses, uh, uh, holding back uh, floods and so on and so forth. So um, uh, as we spread out, and we have more more space. It's about more about quality um, rather than depaving. And of course, into the rural areas where we've often got the very important um, protected areas. Um, we need to protect those, of course, we need to buffer those and the, and where we can connect them together. And of course, this may involve working with, uh, will involve working with landowners in order to achieve that. Um, and of course, we're getting into agriculture here, which is an important land use and working with farmers to um, make sure our green infrastructure networks uh, enable wildlife and people to move in and out of, uh, of the towns and cities. And then we're just going to go finally into some categories here. So uh, people wanted to include these because managers of, of these areas obviously are very interested in in what other people are up to. So of course it will depend on what the constraints are, what the opportunities are. Uh, but within our parks and green spaces now, people are interested in reducing the amount of uh, amenity grass, having more more uh, wildflower meadows, uh, planting with wildlife in mind, which could be native planting or, or species with a documented value for wildlife, for instance, plants for pollinators in the RHS lists. Um, and, and really, um, uh, encouraging people to uh, back into parks, perhaps, uh, although there's been a lot of interest since lockdown, of course, uh, making sure people feel safe, making space for uh, for um, uh, people who perhaps uh, might not normally be catered for. There's a lot of interest in producing, uh, preparing, uh, providing space for girls, for instance. Um, in playgrounds now, a lot of lot of um, advice on that. So we need to do more with our parks, um, and uh, you know that's also about training as well, training for for maintenance staff. Um, now, very recently, uh, there seems to have been a, a lot of interest in greening industrial sites. And you know, for many years, people have argued, well, you'll never be able to do anything. Uh, with industrial sites but what, what what we're finding now is that of course there may be an obligation to to bring in sustainable drainage um, on these sites so that there's that um, but now the operators and owners of industrial sites are increasingly asking well could green infrastructure improve the well-being of employees and uh, there's there's a lot of interest in using what would have been perhaps a grey or or certainly um, simple amenity grassland areas of, of doing more with with those so that people have somewhere uh, to have their have their um, lunch and so on. Um, do more for, for, for uh, biodiversity and of course there's going to be a lot of green roofs uh, going up in the future. We hope there'll be a lot of PVs, but it's worth noting that you can combine PVs with green roofs, it's called biosolar roofs. So we're hoping that as well as the PVs, which I'm sure will be ubiquitous because of the um, the price of electricity now, we're wanting to see green roofs as habitats and source control mechanisms on industrial uh, commercial buildings. And uh, the Department of Education has already uh, issued advice and guidance uh, on schools, on new schools. So. Uh, a, there's a lot more that can be done in schools, shade trees, green roofs, natural play, um, and perhaps sp spreading the um, approach to wildlife gardening throughout uh, the campus rather than being in a very small area, which was the traditional approach. So uh, plenty of ideas for 
uh, existing schools to retrofit features, but also when, with the planning of new schools to make sure um, that they are as climate resilient as they could be through the use of green infrastructure. And uh, the health service is, is now a major partner with, with those of us uh, providing green infrastructure. And of course, some of the new hospitals have got innovative features on them. So we're already seeing that. We've also got the, um, the National Health Forest, which is a tree planting initiative. Um, there's often car parks where there could be more done to include sustainable drainage. And often there are already uh, attractive features within hospital grounds that perhaps we could make more of, give people more access to it. And there's a therapeutic uh, a side to this as well. So people within hospital probably need to see more greenery around them. Um, it, it's been shown to speed recovery. Um, and also there can be uh, initiatives within uh, hospital grounds and, and in and around healthcare facilities and the biophilic design movement uh, is compatible with this and of course biophilic designers who want to bring more planting into their schemes um, uh, can can look at this and and find out how how their planting can be more functional and not just as uh, not just aesthetic Uh, back to our linear infrastructure. So, of course, we we already have uh, roads where we can do much more with verges. And again, plenty of good examples now of wildflowers on verges from organisations like Plant Life that can 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 tell you how to do that. Working with the agencies that look after roads, um, the the railways again very important green corridors. So there's a there's a conversation about that. Um, and of course, working with all of the utility companies to maximize access where it's where it's feasible and safe and to help um, these linear features to build our overall green infrastructure network. Um, and of course, that's a really important theme in green infrastructure that it's about building a landscape wide network. So we need to keep coming back to that and uh, maximizing the opportunities to to connect features and build that network. And of course, linear features also include um, our, our waterways. Um, and you know, often that can be that could be combined, for instance, along canals with cycleways. But we can probably do more to to help to maintain higher, uh, better water quality by having buffers, uh, for instance, from from urban areas, but also agricultural areas uh, to make sure that the water quality is improved and maintained, but also creating habitats uh, along these linear features. So I think there's a lot more we can do um, in towns and cities, but also out in the rural areas to improve water quality by putting in buffers and, and habitats. And in urban areas, of course, uh, there's there's been a lot of uh, interest in using those as a setting for regeneration and new development, and that continues, I'm sure. But we're increasingly realising that we need to put natural features into these urban waterways as well. Uh, it makes them probably more interesting, but of course it means that we're improving water quality um, and we're helping to build the the network for wildlife so that's something that perhaps has been a little bit overlooked in the past um, but it's firmly on the agenda now and there's plenty of advice and, and examples of how to do that so um i just want to um finish with a reminder about the case studies which are on the website uh this is just one one of many, and I I understand that this will be curated and added to in the future, so that uh, for each case study, um, there there's a, a summary, obviously, of what it is and and what the the main um, thoughts were for those behind it. This particular one in Sunderland was uh, inspired by uh, historic buildings, um, and there's some interesting. Uh, 
lessons there through their partnership approach. Uh, but for each case study, um, there's been a, an effort to tie it back to the principles uh, so that people can can see how how that works. And you know, if it's not, um, if there are not, if there are issues that have have been missed, then again, you know, there's no harm in learning from mistakes. But most of them, are, you know, it's a po there's a positive reason for them being included, of course. Um, so plenty of case studies for people to look at. Um, I think we're coming to coming up to our 45 minutes now, so I'm going to end it there. But of course, that means we've got time for questions. So I'll hand it back to Milena, who will who will be in charge of that process. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Gary, for your presentation and apologies to our audience for the technical issues at the start of the webinar. We will make a recording available, so hopefully you can catch the start if you missed it. Um, we will now move on to the Q&A uh, part of our session. So we have a few questions in the chat and we'll make our way down in order of most upvoted questions. If we don't get time to answer all the questions, we will endeavour to answer any remaining questions in our FAQs section on the GI website or through email to today's participants. Right, so I'll just have a look at the most upvoted question, which Gary is about biodiversity net gain. Um, so do any of these methods easily translate to biodiversity net gain units? Small sites need to be clever in their design to meet 10% biodiversity net gain, but most of these don't necessarily create habitats that can count towards their metric calculations. Small sites are wanting guidance on how to deliver BNG on site. Anything that you can point to that would help with this? Yes, so of course, um, biodiversity net gain is is something that's a, a statutory requirement. There's a 10 percent uh, uh, target there. And of course, for a previously developed gray site, um, 10 percent is is a re relatively uh, easy uh, target to to reach. Um, but of course, Increasing green infrastructure as a strategy is completely compatible with biodiversity net gain. Uh, but if people need to know more about biodiversity net gain, then they should probably talk to um, or look at one of the webinars uh, that deals with that. So um, this isn't about biodiversity net gain per se, but of course, um, uh, as a as a planning requirement, but of course, promoting green infrastructure with biodiversity in mind will bring about uh, nature recovery. So it, it's part of the setting, if you like, for net gain. Well, I mean, all I would say is biodiversity net gain is is only one of of several ways of uh, you know improving the world, if you like. And there are way there are other other issues in here. So, for instance, for uh, urban greening factor, um, the the target is to have 0.4 or 40 percent of the site as green. Now, uh, in in theory, that leads to you know the potential for more than 10 percent net gain if those um, if that site was grey to begin with, and if um, uh, the, that green infrastructure is as biodiverse as it could be, which is what I think uh, the way we should be thinking. So we should try and integrate these issues. I know that's sometimes easier said than done. Uh, but yes, I think if people have particular interest in biodiversity net gain, probably they should look at one of the really excellent uh, you know, seminars that's already been run on that. So I'm not ducking the issue, but uh, I, I think probably uh, people need to to look at that uh, look at that separately from this. Brilliant, thanks, Gary. Uh, next question is about, so this is seeing as this guidance isn't a mandatory requirement of planning policy slash decisions, how do you see this translating into local plan preparation? GI studies and strategies which are then adopted by LPAs as material planning considerations, or would this mean translating the guidance into a local context in terms of design, principles, standards, etc.? Asking from a rural authority perspective. Yes, so um, I think the the answers uh, implied in the question in a way. So yes, this is guidance. It's no more than that. Of course, there are statu 
statutory issues uh, referred to in this sustainable drainage um, and uh, biodiversity net gain. But yes, as as the question implies, um, the local local authorities will be producing their plans. They may well be uh, producing green infrastructure strategies, which would be a material consideration. And of course, those strategies can refer to this kind of guidance. But also, if there are particular zones within the borough uh, which which where there would be a special consideration or particular issues, then guidance could be written by the authority uh, using this kind of uh, information um, which would you know which would help to um, inform applicants within that area and landowners and land managers and so on. Um, the, you know, the the strategic direction and that's where the mapping comes in of course that's really important but also um, hints about what the approach might be as uh, you know as linear features are managed or upgraded and, and so on so uh, yes local authorities will take this forward they will make it locally appropriate they will analyze their own area their own um, uh, and their own residents and citizens and visitors will you know have an input into that so although the principles will be the same the detail will will uh, be site specific or borough specific or zone specific yep great thank you uh, this is another interesting one so who should take a lead on creating all of these interconnected green initiatives so many different parties will need to work together but who should coordinate Oh, wow. Yeah, that that is I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? That we have that land ownership is fragmented um, and it's really important that uh, the local authority as the planning authority are involved in this, of course, um, but it may well be that it's the major landowners um, which who who are partners in that. So, you know, you'll often so in the urban area, uh, we find that the business improvement districts are, are are excellent partners in this this kind of exercise because the business improvement districts um, are membership organisations which represent most of the businesses in a particular area. And nowadays, the business improvement districts. Um, are very, very interested in green infrastructure because it, it helps to bring business into an area, or improves an area. And so that makes the job of the local authority a little bit easier. So we've seen these partnerships uh, work really well in London and other cities. Uh, so I think that that's a good example of that partnership working. And then in the rural areas, there's, there's often very large uh, landowners and estates. Um, of course, there may be there may be, uh, you know, utilities, there may be, uh, you know, highways, railways and so on. And most of these these organisations have got their own specialists now, ecologists, green infrastructure specialists, landscape architects and so on. So I think even in the rural areas, we can make partnerships which involve uh, significant land uh, landowners. And, and really start that conversation and use the approaches that are outlined in this guidance and in the framework to do that, to perhaps improve even more the work that many of them are already doing. And of course, some of the private estates that there are are very, very proactive now at, at uh, and very innovative um, uh, with green infrastructure. Uh, good examples are, you know, flood defence initiatives where you know, DEFRA partner, partnering with large landowners, with local authority to do to do things uh, which probably were unthinkable 10 years ago. So I, I think, uh, yeah, partnership, it's it's uh, it's um, it's a cliche, but yes, uh, and it can be done. And of course, the more people we can draw into the, these partnerships, the easier it's going to be. Good consultation, of course, really important. Multiple consultation events so that people are, are not asked once, but they, they they can be involved and can help to um, refine plans as well. So, yeah, sorry, a bit rambling there, but hopefully um, made some useful points. Yeah, very useful points. Thank you, Gary. Next question. How do we create a surveying and monitoring monitoring approach to GI? What scale? Who records and paid by whom? Where do the records go? 
Oh, wow. Well, of course, we have our county record centres, don't we? So they're always going to be at, at the heart of this. And people um, can also look at Natural England's mapping, um, mapping assets as well. So there's plenty of information. The, uh, England and the UK in, in general is, is world class when it comes to um, recording environmental assets. Um, and of course, with GIS now, it's a lot easier to access this. Uh, but I I see technology uh, coming into this more and more. So I'm seeing a lot of evidence now of people using satellite data, um, which could be relatively inexpensive um, and a good way of, of keeping an eye on the changes that take place. Because, of course, record centers, um, uh, they, they they can't always uh, they, they they can't always keep up with the changes that are, that are there because it's quite a laborious process uh, collating and analyzing records. So I see satellite data, uh, perhaps things like drones being used more and more, and artificial intelligence um, to to interpret that satellite data, which hopefully will be cost efficient, affordable, and then that will complement. The existing um, um, network uh, of of record centres uh, and others, and of course, we'll see a lot more integration of data as well. So I think technology might actually be quite helpful with that. And I also think the recording of, for instance, wildlife can be automated. So you know, we've seen, for instance, bat detectors that are connected to the internet, and you know, in the future. Uh, we'll be able to identify other species as well. So uh, yeah, uh, there's, a, there's a lot out there already. People may not always be aware of it. Every time I look at these uh, mapping um, uh, assets, I'm always impressed, but it, it's going in the right direction and people should perhaps keep an eye on innovation here uh, and, and not rule it out, You know, take a chance, encourage those innovators that are out there doing that kind of thing. Great, thank you, Gary. Right, we've got another five minutes, so maybe we can get two, possibly three questions in. So the next question is, how are we ensuring to encourage more green infrastructure in more disadvantaged urban communities and places? And they've given a link to uh, uh, a, the longest meadow verge in the country in Rotherham. But yes, how do we encourage more GI in more disadvantaged urban communities and places? Well, of course, we go back to the mapping, don't we, uh, to begin with? So we know from from mapping of um, uh, in, indices of deprivation. I mean, interestingly, when I've worked on on the mapping of deprivation in in, in places like the the Black Country, for instance, um, often where the most uh, deprived people are is often where. Uh, the urban heat island is is at its worst. It's often where air quality is at its worst. And, you know, authorities actually do have a pretty good idea of where these these places are and where people need most help. So we I think we've got a pretty good idea of where we need to help people. So I think it's about making sure that there are um, that there are initiatives which are geographically focused in those areas, but also working with people that live in those areas in order to get them involved, to create jobs, to provide training, and also get people volunteering, uh, because we know the benefits of getting involved in the creation and the nurture of green infrastructure. And I find that housing organize, housing associations uh, have been particularly good at this um, recently. Um, so, of course, they are the landlord, if you like, for for uh, for a lot of people in in some of these areas, um, and they are interested in this. Um, and also, they're in a good position to um, corral the resources to work with local authorities to do that. And I know that there are there are organizations that are really interested in partnering uh, tra for training and, and other things along these lines. So um, uh, I suppose I should mention as a good example, the Peabody, um, the Peabody Housing Association, which is quite a large one. You know, they have a huge housing estate. They have many, but they have a huge um, housing estate in Southeast London called Thamesmead, and they have a green infrastructure 
um, plan for that, and that has led to a whole series of spin-off projects which include improving the maintenance of green space and training their staff, um, educational projects, and also helping to refine the brief for refurbishment uh, and redevelopment schemes as well. So uh, have a look at that if you want an example. And of course, there are plenty of other um, examples around the UK, but this is perhaps at the beginning of a process, and I think we'll see a lot more, um, uh, many more examples of, of where people focus on, on these deprived areas. So um, yeah, have a, have a look at that. Um, and also a lot of the um, a lot of the trusts and charities I'm, I'm sure would like to partner. And then we've got the health authorities as well who who have an interest in preventative medicine. So so I think a coalition here, a coalition approach um, working with people. Yep, Pl plenty, plenty of good ideas out there. Brilliant. Thank you, Gary. And um, we'll just have one last comment. This isn't a question, this is just a comment saying, I do believe that this would be much more effective if LPAs had a mandatory requirement to produce GI strategies with associated action plans to be audited against. And it will link in well with LNRS as well as integrated protected sites and biodiversity net gain. So it's not really a question, but just absolutely that these linkages are important. If you have any final comments, Gary, we've got a minute left uh, and then we can well, close. Uh, very good. Well, comment. of course, uh, um, you know this is this is a political issue but i would i would always vote for making green infrastructure strategies and guidance mandatory um but of course uh, we have to be positive here and and note that most authorities now um are interested in this and have already produced there are plenty of excellent examples of policies, strategies, guidance along these lines and this is part of a journey isn't it so i think we're getting more and more um interested in this people are learning about it and as we've as as i've already said we've got plenty of partners out there housing associations um people involved in 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 providing infrastructure um they're they're, they're starting to listen now um even people that at one time uh, like the the industrial sector who would have thought that this is not relevant for them are now realizing that it's important for their staff and their neighbors. Um, and I think things like nature recovery networks start to pull everything together um, along with sustainable drainage, which is the statutory or is becoming a statutory requirement. So I think with the sustainable drainage, nature recovery and the willingness uh, and the openness that's there. I, I, think, I think that, you know, we're, we're pushing open doors now with a, with a lot of this. So it's tough, I know. Um, it would be nice to have more support, more money, of course, but uh, I think we can perhaps make the most of what we've got, um, you know, as, as people find out more about this. Brilliant. Thank you, Gary, for your presentation and all your brilliant answers. Thank you to everyone for joining us and uh, we will be making a recording of this available soon. Thank you for joining and we'll close the, the webinar. Thank you. Bye bye.